I wanted to affect real change, you had to make your way to the top. You had to get to the policies. You had to get to the program designs, what things were gonna look like, um, and implement those services if you were really going to impact that person. So I believe that that was the best thing that I could have ever done, having to work my way through the entire workforce system From Fiori Communications, it's How I Got Here, a show of inspiring stories from Tallahassee area leaders, business owners, and neighbors, all the challenges, opportunities, inspirations, the twists and turns of life that led them to where they are today. Everyone has a story worth telling, and I am really grateful that we get to bring a few of them to you. I truly have been changed by my conversations with these amazing people, and I'm confident you will be too. I'm Dave Fiore, and in this episode, I speak with Kim Moore, Vice President of Workforce Innovation at Tallahassee Community College. The native of nearby Greenville dreamed of being a CEO since she was 14 years old, and achieved that goal when she was selected to lead Workforce Plus, the regional economic and workforce development body now known as Career Source Capital Region. Her success there led to her current position where she is creating new programs to ensure employers have the workers they need so we all have a brighter future. Kim is energetic, engaging, and committed to excellence in everything she does, and she's not afraid of hard work. In fact, she prefers it. She continues to pursue continuing education, serves on numerous boards, and still remembers marching around her house with her trumpet in high school to earn first chair. Her many awards include being named to the TCC Hall of Fame, the 2019 Economic Innovator of the Year, and most recently, the International Idle and Car Exemplary Leadership Award. We began our conversation with how she would describe herself today. I would describe myself as someone who is very passionate, um, driven, committed, and loyal to causes that are oftentimes much bigger than myself. Where does that come from? I think the drive comes from growing up and just kind of being exposed in a way that you felt that you were always the underdog. Mm -hmm. Underdog um, in the sense of, you know, realizing that you were never going to be the smartest. You were never going to have all the resources. So what box or category do you fall into? Mm -hmm. And my thought was that, you know what, if the thought is that through perception, I didn't think this individually, but through the perception of how I felt that other people felt that um, I was the underdog, then I was certainly going to prove them wrong. And it wasn't going to be a short prove them wrong. It was going to be to the extreme. <laughs> I really wish I wouldn't really, have had that. Really, really prove them wrong. Yeah, right? I, yeah they, they were going to really, really wish they wouldn't have had that thought. So, yeah. Okay. You're very good at keeping your private information private online because <laughs> I tried to snoop around and couldn't get a lot. Uh, so if that's your goal, you are achieving you it. You know, there you go. <laughs> I would never be here with you if I did that, that's right? That's true. There'd be no reason. Uh, so did you grow up in Tallahassee? I actually grew up in Greenville, Florida. Greenville. Our east of Tallahassee. Okay. Mm-hmm. Known for the Christmas festival, right? The Christmas Isn't it? festival, but also, um, you know, Ray Charles. Oh, I did not know yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So that that fact, I won't call it a little known because there's a there's a statue, if you will, in the park of uh, Greenville. So, so he was he born there? Through. I think he grew up there as a child. I don't think okay. he was born there, yeah. But there is a house there as well that... Um, All right, so did you grow up in Greenville? I did. Grew up in Greenville and did not come to the big city of Tallahassee until the ripe old age of 17 for college. Okay. Yeah. I mean, was Tallahassee a place, did you come to go shopping and do stuff? Yes. So I always knew, (laughs) Um, I always knew that, of course, Tallahassee was here and that, um, you know, hey, we'd come on Fridays, go to McDonald's, you know, and do all of that because, of course, there aren't, there wasn't a McDonald's in Greenville or Madison. Now there is. And so, yeah, shopping, Northwood Mall, date myself back, (laughs) yeah, with the escalator. I remember that as a kid. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Yeah. (laughs) The technology. Yeah, the technology. Because I grew up in a really small town in central Florida, about 10,000 people. 
so I assume Greenville is smaller than it, that? It's probably around, I would estimate around 1,200 people. 1,200? Yeah. Okay. Would you consider yourself kind of a country girl growing up? Absolutely. I still hold on to that. I still, you know, carry that even into my, my world now and my work, and that is your word is your bond. Yeah. So that is something that you, you know, most people associate with, you know, having grown up in a small place and yes. Right. Small town values. Absolutely. Kind of Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So you come to Tallahassee to go to Tallahassee Community College. Come to Tallahassee, right? go to college. And again, I remember being walking on that campus and I thought it was like, oh my gosh, how will anybody ever find out who I am here in Tallahassee? It's so big and carrying that heavy backpack and thinking, what in the world did I just get myself into? All right. Well, let me, let me take a step back. So I'm guessing that you probably accomplished a lot in high school and stuff. Well, I'll let you tell me, but I, I assume that when you came to Tallahassee, it was kind of, maybe you had a thought of, okay, I, I was kind of a top dog in Greenville and now I'm going to just get lost in the mix in Tallahassee. Is that what you were thinking? So I was an honor student and of course did the band and soloist and all of that. Things what did that you play? I was actually a trumpet player nice. and maybe that's an aha moment too. I actually started in middle school with the trumpet and did not realize the importance of first chair and last chair, if you've ever been in the band. I was in the band my whole yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. So in middle school, last chair all the time, last chair, and I was just as happy as a lark. <laughs> Didn't realize until I got to high school what that really meant, that you right. were like the worst one. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I remember in ninth grade, once that dawned on me, I was like, okay, I am getting out of this spot. So I literally practiced all summer. My parents, my sisters um, just wanted to get me out of the house, but I'd practice um, both at uh, with standing up and marching as well as in the house. I'm like playing all the time. You but were marching the, in the house? Marching in the house, <laughs> marching outside, everywhere. I was like, I'm going to do this whole makeover. And by the sophomore year, I was first chair. When wow. I came back from that summer, I was first chair and soloist. Yeah. Wow. So that's mm -hmm. kind of the underdog thing again, yeah, right? Yeah, there and, you uh, go. Yeah, didn't expect much and clearly didn't expect you were going to go from zero to one, you know? I can't even imagine. I mean, I was in the band from sixth grade all the way through college. Uh -huh. and But I don't think I ever – I played the French horn. I don't uh -huh. think I ever marched around my living room <laughs> – <laughs> practicing. <laughs> I can't imagine what your parents thought. They're like, what is she doing? Oh, well, you know what? I don't think that they got it outside of what they call noise. Kim is making noise again. <laughs> Mom, Kim is making noise until they actually saw me on the field. And then I'd come up and, and like, she's turned this into music. She's a soloist. And right. people are like taking pictures. And so they're like, oh. <laughs> so there, doesn't look so stupid now, right? Exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, tell me about your parents. What are they like or what, you know, what was it like growing up in your house? So my dad, military, 38 plus years, mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, um, Army, and always worked hard. I always remember um, he worked both, he, he later ended up in the um, guard. So it was just the weekend piece of it then. But during the week, he worked at a lumber mill and I would always see him. He'd always knock on the door before he left for work and it'd still be dark outside and say, you know, rise and shine. That was, a, that was a song, rise and shine. And so I'm like, oh my God, it's not time to get up again. But always going to work in the dark, always coming back home in the dark, working really, really hard to take care of his family. Mm -hmm. And so me seeing this, I'm thinking, Wow. I mean, he's such a hard worker. Um, you know, what is it that I can do to make it all worth what he's doing for oh, us? Wow. Yeah. That's literally what I was thinking. I was like, you know, how do how do you how do you pay them back, you know, for for doing and you know what they're doing and the sacrifices that they make. My mom was a stay at home mom right up until my sister and I were eleven months apart. Mm. Um, we're in high school. And um then she went to work in, in retail and just just both of them, just the sacrifices that they made and just the importance that they um, placed on education and opportunity. And for me, it was always that I know they want you to be a good person and they I know that they want you to do well, but I want to show them through my actions in such a way that they can dream the biggest dream with me. But I know that I'm going to have to do it first, much like the trumpet playing <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that, to help them see how this connects. But that, that was, yeah, that was always a thought. Um, very much supportive. Um, always there. Um, teachers meetings, 
the, the works, but yeah. yeah. It's a very mature attitude for a kid to say, I want to make my parents' sacrifice and hard work mean something. I mean, where, where, did you, where did that come from? Well, I will tell you, at 14, I was writing in my legal pad. Um, I was a child that my mom would say, why are you using your allowance and buying all these books? <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do with books? And my sister was like buying candy and food. I was like, no, I'm going to buy these books because I enjoy reading so much because you could go to so many different places there. So at 14, got my little pad and writing down what I want to do. And that was to be a CEO. I wanted to be that person that at ultimately- 14. At 14 okay. that ultimately made decisions. I was applying for college, didn't know, you know, all the processes that, you know, even that a 14 year old at that time couldn't get in. Right. Um, but yeah. Wow. Do you have your sister? Right. Do you have any other siblings? I have a younger sister who's young, um, six years, six years that separates us. So I'm a middle child. Okay. Yeah. And uh, other than band, was there anything else? Did you participate in anything or clubs or have any other interests? Model United Nations. Um, what else did I participate? Because I, I was literally always thinking about what life was going to be like after high school. So, so I, were you thinking about getting out of Greenville, or I mean, not that you wanted to escape, right. but the, like the the bigger world out there somewhere? I knew that that world existed. I'd read about it. I read about it in all my books, so I wanted to get there. Um, as a matter of fact, I remember as a child, we 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 had family in Central Florida, Tampa, and we'd always go there, you know, at least once or twice a year. And I'd see these tall buildings, skyscrapers, and I thought, and I'd tell them, I said, I'm going to work at the top of that building. <laughs> I'm going to work at the top of that building, and I'm going to make decisions. That's what I'm going to do. And so it was always, you know, how do you get there? I I I understood the correlation that you had to work hard. Of course, I didn't know all the intricacies of it, but yeah. Right. So it sounds like being being in charge was going to be a, a goal, right? Being a CEO, making decisions, like you wanted to be the one making the calls on stuff. I wanted to be the one making the calls, but also I wanted to understand it enough through working hard because I never separated that part. I always, again, saw my dad, you know, work hard, get up early, you know, work, start in the, you know, dark in the morning and then you come back. So I knew that that had to happen, right. but that how the reward came by way of, you know, achieving your goal. And that was my goal. Tell me what happened you when you arrived on the campus of Tallahassee Community College. I thought, okay, were these dreams and everything that I've written down at 14 really going to happen here? Um, I will tell you that even though I wrote that down at 14, it wasn't until high school, maybe just take it back just a step, high school, um, senior year with Miss Laura Young, who was my English teacher, who had us do a project for seniors about what do you want to do with your life? And I thought the safest bet at that time, I wrote down that I was going to tell to Tallahassee, I was going to earn a degree, and I was going to go back to Greenville, Madison, and um, get a state job and do the norm. You know, that's what I was going to do. That's what, what I knew. And she called me up to her desk and she asked me, she said, Kim, is this really what you want to do? And I was like, yes, ma'am. And she said, is that really what you want to do? You have great grades and all these things that she added up. And I said, I actually want to be a CEO. And I said it really softly <laughs> because I'm like, I am not letting this out that I have to deal with people thinking that this person wants to be a CEO, right? Right. And what is, you know, where is she coming from with that? And I said it to her and she, she said, well, then go back and write that down. And I said, okay. And I, uh, for, you know, for forever, I still call that my permission to dream moment. Mm -hmm. So when I got to Tallahassee Community College, I'm thinking, okay, I got the backpack, I got the dream, but how is all of this going to work? So yeah, it was quite scary. Um, scary in the sense that, you know, small town USA brought into what I thought was, you know, mega USA <laughs> Tallahassee. Right. So you finish up at, at um, TCC, and then you move on to Florida State right. to pursue a, and earn a degree in criminology. Yes. So yes. why criminology? Well, um, at that time, I thought, you know what? Actually, that was by virtue of Mr. Musso. Mr. Musso um, was a faculty um, person at TCC, taught criminology. He seemed so passionate about it. You know, never mind that I said I wanted to be CEO, but he was so passionate about this area. I thought, you know what? Maybe I can explore that further. And I still thought leadership. I thought that, you know, ultimately, you know, I could lead something at FDLE 
or you hmm. know, or be a warden of a prison. I mean, it's I'm always thinking about still the CEO. Yeah, of something, it's right. It, right. So I'm thinking that path is still clear. And I remember my last semester at Florida State, and I'm at a career fair, and I'm talking to the folks at the city of Tallahassee Police Department table. And I told them, I said, well, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, my route. I said, you know, detective, and then I'll make my way here. And then they said, well, you got to do two years on the beat. And I said, do you mean the streets? <laughs> and he said, yes. And I, I never thought about it again. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> you hadn't really thought, again, it, consistent with your other stuff, right? <laughs> that you knew what the goal was, but you hadn't really thought out all the steps in between. Correct. Right. Correct. I never thought about the streets and never thought about, you know, me kind of running and chasing folks and all of that. <laughs> so didn't think about that part. And so that led to, and interesting, interestingly enough, I guess it does have an aspect of it, my first job at a college. Mm. Where um, I graduated from FSU and then for like the next two months, I was religious about this. What used to be the old Department of Labor, um, later Workforce Plus, later Career Source, right. I went there as I was still employed at McDonald's. I was a manager all throughout okay. college, right. yet again, managing people and things, yeah. but all throughout college, but literally every Monday, because that's when they would release new jobs. Mm -hmm. And I would go every Monday, they knew me, and they you, you were only supposed to get three job leads. They'd give me like a rolling list. I mean, it was probably tall as me, list of job leads. And I was on a mission that I was going to get that next job. And it took me, took me three months out of college, and I landed the job at Department of Revenue in child support enforcement, okay. which involved an aspect of detective piece. And that, that was probably one of the most intriguing jobs in the sense that I got to think ahead of people who didn't necessarily want to be found. Right. <laughs> so you did get to use yes. some of those skills. <laughs> Back in the day, you had to physically go down to the office to get job leads, and they would print something out and hand it to you. They would print it out and hand it to you, and Miss Darlene Phillips was the lady who would do that. And I, I always point this out, the story, because I, I tell people, I said, I used the system before I led the system, mm -hmm. because later that would end up being the organization that I right. led. Mm -hmm. Sure. When I was looking at your your bio or you know, as much information again that I could find that was <laughs> limited. There was, you know, your first one we when we when you list your job at workforce, yeah. which which comes a little bit later, there's a there's about a six year gap between mm -hmm. you graduating and and when you took that job. Yeah. So was Department of Revenue, did that fill up all that space or did you have other jobs in between? So Department of Revenue fills at that time, you know, there was a whole thought about you needed two years of professional experience before you jumped into your next gig. Sure. Unlike where we are now. So I worked at Department of Revenue for a year and eleven months. And even there, you know, the, the thought of how do you achieve and do great things where you are, even if that's not where your, you know, landing spot, you hope ultimately that's where it ends up being. And for me, um, I was a child support enforcement worker and we had a quota. You had to identify, locate, put whatever actions in place, 40 of those things a month. And I was at 60 and 70 and had gotten all the little awards that you could get for that role. And I'm like, okay, what else am I going to do? Right. And I then stumbled across a workforce development ad at the time. And so that was a year and 11 months. And then thereafter, I got into workforce. I came back to the big city of Tallahassee um, with thought being that workforce, wow. So if I get this skill, yet another right. dream, if I get this skill, it's, you know what, I could use it all over the world. Workforce is everywhere. Right. And that is why I made the jump from, you know, child support enforcement to workforce development as a case manager. Okay. So what you don't see in those six years is the ascending up. So I case manager for a year. Then I went into, a, it was a senior workforce development specialist and responsible for the other case managers. Then to overseeing a center, actually the former, the South Monroe location. Right. Some people may remember that. And then going into contract and compliance. So literally, that was the second job, but that was the, the ladder that moved into everything else. Okay. So what, what did a case manager do? Case manager. So there were 130 individuals who were receiving some type of assistance. It could be public assistance, could be you know food stamps, whatever the case. But you had to work with them to ensure that there was a plan in place that 
help them to achieve self-sufficiency. Okay. Could be a job, could be education, could be, you know, whatever the case it may be, but working with them to achieve that plan. I call it an accountability partner at this time. Um, 130, you're thinking, well, I can't sometimes manage my own life. You got 130 <laughs> people. Right. But it was different than with Department of Revenue, where I remember going in at the first day and you had 600 to 700 cases one time. So, wow. yeah. All right. So you're working your way up the ladder, mm-hmm. right? And in just a few years, you're CEO, you're running Workforce Plus, <laughs> right? That seems like a pretty, pretty fast ascension to that job. Well, the funny thing, and and my colleagues will know this, um, who have seen me along the way, but an orientation, because I actually left the full-time government job to take on an OPS temporary role. That's how I got to workforce. I was not selected as a full-time worker. There were, I think, only four out of 10 that were selected full-time. I was OPS. There's a lesson in that too, right? Absolutely. That's why you can make the jump and it doesn't matter where you start. certainly does matter where you finish. So um, to take that leap of security to go into something something that was clearly going to be driven by, you know, hopefully all the effort that you put in, but, you know, you just don't know whether it's going to work out. But in orientation, I asked the then CEO, Dr. Wyatt Pope, what it took to become CEO. And he said, Kimberly, that's a great question. He said, but you're in orientation now. He said, I've been doing this for 30 years (laughs) and you got to pay your dues. And and he, this story has been told later by him. um, But I said, I don't have that long. (laughs) <laughs> and I just, I'm like, there's got to be a path to do it, but I'm just not going to do it 30 years. And that starts the story of, yeah, probably um, right at about five years yeah. later or six years later, I was CEO. Right. I know hard work is part of that. I mean, mm-hmm. a huge part of that. But what is it about workforce, workforce development, helping people make those connections and relationships? What is it that really caught on with you that you became so passionate about it? I saw how much that through case management, you can help the individual person, one person at a time. But I knew then if I wanted to affect real change, you had to make your way to the top. You had to get to the policies. You had to get to the program designs, what things are going to look like Mm. um, and implement those services if you were really going to impact that person. So I believe that that was the best thing that I could have ever done, having to work my way through the entire workforce system um, to understand it better when I became CEO. It wasn't theory. It was practice. I knew it. You know, um, I knew people, and I still see the people here in the community that I work with hands-on, one-on-one. Right. Yeah. And how does that feel to see them now? It feels amazing. They're in different roles now. They are so excited to tell me that, hey, I got the degree, or hey, now my kids are grown, or hey, you know, all their accomplishments. So there is so much value in what programs like that can do to help um, be that Laura Young, like Laura Young was for me, the permission to dream, right. that programs can do that and be that for individuals. So that's what I've always taken my work to be, not just for the individual, but also for the community. Let's dream the biggest dream together. Right. During that time, you were also very vocal in the community in a lot of ways, becoming kind of the face of workforce, you know, for for a lot of people and very, very public. And you were, you know, you did a great job with that. Did, did you enjoy that part of it? Did you enjoy the public facing part of the job as well? Interestingly enough, I never thought, even when, you know, the whole dreaming and walking through what CEO meant, I didn't think that that part of it would be me. I I knew I'd do all the administrative pieces. I knew that we would keep it in the road and we would, you know, achieve goals. But um, I was just thinking about it before I came in for our conversation today and, you know, how that all started. And I remember meeting with, you know, I'd gone through this whole branding um, training and marketing about, you know, when you needed to do what. A whole year of investing in that, trying to understand, you know, media releases, when you do that. I mean, it was very key that communication was important. Right. So I understood that, that aspect, but I just didn't think it was going to be me. So I was meeting with one of our radio partners and I said, I am looking for this voice that people will trust and that they will believe in, that when they hear it, they'll know it. I said, that's what I'm looking for. And she said, that's you. Right. And I said, really? And that's kind of how I stumbled into, you know, radio, TV, whatever. But no, I never thought that that piece would be it. And though it's become much of, you know, it's a big part of what I do and and how I communicate, that was never the intent. (laughs) 
<laughs> so you weren't seeking the spotlight. No. But you got it. Got it. So how do you feel about it now that you're in it? Um, it's a responsibility. It's a trusted responsibility in that you need to make sure that what you're communicating is something of value. And it takes into account, takes into account just in general, how individuals can be supported, how communities can be supported. Never about self. It can't be self-promotion. It always has to be about the people. Mm. And so that's, that's the piece that I try and remember when I'm communicating. Who does it help? You know, what's the intended impact? And yeah. Right. Does relationship building and networking, the whole playing the game, and I mean, does that does that come naturally to you? Or do you have to kind of gear up and, and kind of psych yourself up for those kind of things? Um, not psych myself up anymore, but at the onset, I literally thought, again, small town values that when I became CEO, I said, I literally have to go and shake everybody's hand. And I, for the first 90 days, I wore myself just ragged. I was so <laughs> tired because yeah. I could not, I'm like, how am I going to do this? And so that's when, again, with having a conversation about radio and everything else that I got to find an effective way to do it, realizing that people get their information a lot of different ways. So that's when it came up being the plan of, you know, doing all these things. In terms of connecting with people, um, always I make it what's, what you know, what's in it for them. And if I could start there, then the rest of it is easy. Yeah, not going in there with my intentions of what I wanted to be. Have researched enough to know who they are. And what they likely want and be able to respond to that first. So, no, um, in, the, in the beginning, I didn't quite understand that. Now, oh, yeah, I get it. So, again, starting with preparation, hard work, and being ready for the opportunities. Absolutely. Right? You, yeah, opportunity meets preparation always. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. So when did you start seeing yourself as a community leader? Because clearly you are, and I know that that wasn't your intent. You wanted to work hard, get the job, make an impact, do good, but – you're here and you are. So w- when did you kind of, was there ever a moment when you kind of saw yourself, you know, mentioned and with other people that you knew were community leaders that had ever kind of say, Hey, I'm, I'm kind of one of them now. So interestingly enough, um, if you were to come to my house, I would have no awards or anything else there. Um, I always hand them over to my mom. Hmm. Um, it was always for me, it's a point of humility, realizing that you still need to work much harder and keep pushing. Right. So I never keep any of those in, in the house. In terms of the, the just the leader part of it, um, I knew that it was a trusted voice, and I knew that during the time that I was serving as CEO is one of our hardest, you know, recessions, if you will, mm-hmm. then. And I knew that they didn't necessarily care about the person. They cared about the results, and they wanted to make sure that um, we as a community came out better. And because of the critical role that workforce plays, whether it's good times or bad times, that I knew that we were an important voice, and I knew that we needed to stand up. Um, I think from that, you know, I thought, you know what, we're important. Um, but I thought the job was important, not necessarily me that made the job. Right. And until, you know, shorter time later, someone said, well, you are Workforce Plus and Workforce Plus is you. <laughs> right. And I was like, you know what? I can't unravel them. Right. I We joke, I still cannot get the TCC Workforce Development jingle out of my head. That, <laughs> that will be planted there forever. I don't know if you're responsible for that, but... I, I will TCC, tell you workforce it, development. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That'll never leave my head. Which is what it's supposed to do. <laughs> what you know, I, I t- you know, we do work uh, across the different special groups, right. including um, work in um, correctional facilities. And I, I will have to tell you that when I was leaving there, and I guess some of the folks saw me there, and then when they started singing the jingle, <laughs> I was like, "We are big time. We're everywhere. Yeah, we're everywhere." For sure. <laughs> Sorry, that was an aside, but. Uh, <laughs> All right. So during this whole time, and in fact, even now, you are continuing your education through this whole process, which it seems like, you know, it's been a a consistent throughout your career. And one of the things was you graduated from the Disney Institute for Leadership Excellence. So tell me what that experience was like. There is a certain magic that Disney creates. Um, you never see if there is a you know a failure, you just don't see it. Um, they are so well coordinated. And I thought as part of my professional development, and luckily my board of directors agreed because I was so into I want to get professional development, um, to hear from Disney 
and all these different folks that came from across the country to understand how Disney does it and then to take that back into their work mm -hmm. was absolutely amazing. You saw the fl the steps that they had to take. It was nothing by happenstance on this. It was just, it was very thought out, very um, strategic. And I, I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that. And so that was probably the best week of professional development there in wow. hearing it firsthand about how they make the magic works. It's not easy. It's complicated. But the way they carry it out is seamless. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You never see anything. No, no. But one time we were there for um, with my family in December and they were doing that Mickey's Very Christmas thing. Yeah. But we didn't have that special ticket thing. So we had to leave as all these people were coming in. Uh -huh. So they took us behind Main Street yeah. in the parking lot uh -huh. with all the – you could. it was very unmagical. Uh -huh. You could see <laughs> people out there smoking, dumpsters, yeah, you're all like, the no. normal stuff. Yeah. I'm like, no, I don't want to see this. this Where is am I blinded? This is destroying everything. Yeah, but, or uh, even going underground because there's the underground. Yeah, I've part. never done that. I hear yeah. that's really cool though. Yeah. Did you do that yeah, as part of the program? Yeah, we did that as part of the program to go yeah. underground and see how it all works. And I know I have I have some of this out of order, but you also earned a master's degree in business administration from Webster University a certificate from the NACC Institute for Entrepreneurship and Entrepreneurial Studies, and attended FSU again recently, right, and uh, studied educational leadership and policy. So what, what do you get from those experiences? And again, what has driven you to continue this commitment to for professional development and adding to your education? Well, I think it's always going, it's lifelong learning. Um, I always talk about it. I believe in it. And I believe that there's no way around it. You should always continue to learn, um, not only for yourself, but if you're in a serving role, then certainly for the people that you're serving. Um, so with the MBA, that came actually as a result. I was number two at Workforce Plus then. Okay. And I realized at that point, it is fairly close. The same man that said, Kim, you know, the 30 years, it was about to be the transition. And I thought, Oh, my gosh. And I knew that in prior, um, the CEOs, there had been four males um, prior to me. Right. And that they'd all had advanced degrees. And so I remember talking to our board of directors and they were talking and they said, well, well, maybe we just need to, you know, revise the job description. And I said, please don't. You may mm -hmm. do it with another candidate, but do not lower your expectations for me. Let me rise to the occasion. Right. And so for the next two years, um, I studied. I was both the COO, but also working on my MBA. And then a semester, um, I was, I think, a shy of a semester. Once I became CEO, I graduated the next semester, and I had an MBA, and I was a CEO because I really saw the connection to it's great that you have a heart and that, yes, I've served as a case manager and made my way through, but you really got to understand the business aspect. Right. You got to keep the thing afloat. <laughs> I mean, a it's business. a nonprofit, yeah. you know, quasi, but you got to make it you know, work. And so I thought it was important to me as well as important to them to make sure that they had a CEO that could deliver. Right. Mm -hmm. So did that investment of time and effort, did it, was it helpful? Did having that MBA help you run the it organization? Was, it was quite the door opener because I also, not just working directly with the community, of course, I had to work with employers too. So the fact that you had an MBA um, was quite a door opener in the sense that, you know, businesses respected the Credibility. fact that- Credibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I needed that, you know. I, I did not think that if I walked in and said, hey, you know, I got a degree in criminal justice, you know, hey, let's do this thing. Let me talk about your finance. You know, right. that wasn't going to fly. So- right. um, I, I try to, again, what's in it for them? So, yes, the degree was for me, but I also saw how it made sense for yeah. everything that I plan to do. Okay. Now back to your career path. Yeah. In 2013, you were named Vice President of Workforce Innovation, I think was the title at the time, um, at Tallahassee Community College. You're coming back as a vice president from the place that you were overwhelmed <laughs> by just not that many years ago. And it's the position you hold today, although now I think – I want to make sure I get this right. The title is now Vice President of Workforce Development, TCC to Work, and Be Essential. So, is that right? So um, I started off in 2013. I actually accepted the job in 2012, um, started the job because I needed to do a 90-day transition okay. in 2013 as Vice President for Workforce Development. But one of the things, and I was glad that um, you know, President Murdoch um, agreed, but a lot of what I was doing at the time was innovation. It was creating things, things that didn't exist. And so uh, I remember asking, like, would you consider 
a title change. You know, I was like, I'm not talking about a promotion. I just, just to reflect what the work is. And um, there was agreement there. And so workforce innovation, vice president for workforce innovation is okay. what the title um, was shifted to. And the additions TCC to work and be essential represent initiatives that have been created. I call them the birth of um initiatives that have just stayed with me and stayed with our college that are that are critical. Right. So, yeah. All right. Well, that's awesome. So tell me about those programs real quick. What is TCC to Work and Be Essential? TCC to Work is a program. It's actually our umbrella program. So there's over 70 plus workforce programs that get people and from TCC into a job, um, 170,000 plus people we've put to work. And it was important for us to recognize that in addition to the students that we're sending off to FSU FAMU, that there are some students that want to go directly into the workforce and we do that for our community. So that's TCC to work. Be essential is after COVID. You know, the whole thought about are you essential worker or are you not, you know, vulnerable or not vulnerable. And for us, it was how do we take those vulnerable workers and get them into a career short amount of time, 90 days or less Mm -hmm. and um, back on their feet. So that's what Be Essential is about. Mm -hmm. There was also a program called Spark, right? Yes, Spark. And what is that? Spark is about entrepreneurship. Um, I have a passion for, I'm I'm an entrepreneur at heart. Entrepreneur, I'm doing it there within the confines of a college, you know, developing new things. But then there are entrepreneurs that want to, you know, like yourself, um, start their own business and you, you create your next job. So making sure that we have that mindset available for our students through education and training and workshops and other things. So that's mm-hmm. what Spark is. Spark is the entrepreneurial footprint for the college. Okay. Mm-hmm. Hey, everybody. Just a quick reminder that this episode is brought to you by Fiore Communications. Just like people, every business has a story to tell. And we've been helping our clients tell their story since 2001. Because who you are as a company is just as important as what you do. To learn more about how telling your story can make a difference in your business, visit FioriCommunications.com. Thanks again for listening. Now back to the show. Now, when you were at TCC, and I think when most people think of TCC as parents, I have, I'm have i on child five at TCC yeah. right now. <laughs> so invested quite a bit in the, in the programs there. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a stepping stone moving right. on to a four-year degree. Right. But as you pointed out, for thousands and thousands of people, it, it serves a, another purpose. Right. Did you... Did you even know about that when you went there? When were you aware of that? I, I was more aware of that when I was in my capacity at Workforce Plus. Mm-hmm. Um, all of the educational institutions were training partners. And so I understood, you know, how they could help the population of people that I was serving and how they help, could help the community in general. So I drunk the Kool-Aid in that, in that regard. I understood right. it. Outside of that, I mean, I'd also served as the advisory council chair for Lively for eight years, too, okay. at the same time. So I was like, I, I understood the vehicle and the power that education brought and the voice that it needed to have. That's where, you know, I thought that and still believe that I play a critical critical role in being the voice for what education can do. Mm-hmm. Not just one, but it's not the either or, it's the and. And right. that's what Workforce does. Yeah, for sure. You're coming back to TCC. Mm-hmm. I just want to know, I mean, what did that feel like? I mean, when you're as a dreamer and seeing yourself as the CEO and Again, coming back to a place that was just overwhelming to you at first, and now you are running a significant portion of the college. How, how did you feel about that? I felt that I had had the opportunity and was very thankful for it that I got to live out my 1.0 and my dream of becoming a CEO. I saw my 2.0 moving into TCC as an opportunity to provide the pathway and in, in help others accomplish their dreams. You know, I cover, I have adult education, GED in my portfolio there in addition to traditional training and employers and the like. But there is nothing more powerful than seeing people of all ages obtain their GED and realize that the doors are open for all the other possibilities. So that's the magic. 
Right. That's the Disney experience. Okay. Um, yeah. So. So it's not it's not limiting when you get that GED. It's a step. It's toward, the comma. Yeah. It's the comma in okay. life, and that's when I realized that coming back there again, yet again, humbling, realizing that I was the kid with the backpack that didn't know. So I have a different appreciation. I'm I'm a vice president, but I'm also you know the approachable that the students can come to me and say, hey, I'm done. And I set up appointments. I give them a card. Here's my direct number because I understand being that person. Right. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I know you're a vice president, but in the university structure and where you are and the way it's built, it seems like you're pretty much fulfilling a CEO role in your universe. I mean, in in your area you're running the program. Right, right. So, you know, a lot of people said, well, what in the world? You left Workforce Plus. You know, you could have done that for 30 years. And I said that was a problem because you because you know you can do something doesn't mean that you need to stay there. We always have to stretch. And right. that was my stretch to move into an area that, you know what, I had been a student, but not in the, you know, never led something in education. And to be able to do that, you know, one, it's quite the honor. I'm glad that the president, President Murdahl, um, allowed, afforded me that opportunity, but it does have the autonomy, the autonomy to have a real close connection to what's going on in your community and to create programs that drive that. Yes, I'm staying connected to our strategic plan, but there's a whole lot of innovation that gets to come there. I call it the R&D, the research and the development arm for what happens. Yeah. Yeah. What's, if I remember, it was very competitive, this position. I mean, it seems like a lot of people were interviewing for it and it was kind of a public process. If I remember, you knew that it was going to, it was a tough, it was tough to get the job probably, right? Correct. Um, It was a national search as a matter of fact, and had no, you know, set expectations. I will tell you that I remember helping a lot of people to prepare for the interview because I wasn't thinking about oh, you weren't working at, at two. No, oh, okay. it was not on the radar. Um, I, I will tell you that I had my perceptions of education. I thought education um, moved slow. And I knew that I appreciated about workforce if I had an idea of being able to implement it that night, right? <laughs> right. So there was, you know, a little difference there. And yeah. I didn't know how that would mesh. But, yeah, competitive. And I remember getting it down to I think there were four candidates. And I remember when I got the call from President Murdaugh and he was asking, could we go to lunch? And I told him, you know, I said, I said you know, Jim, we don't have to. I said, if you all have selected another candidate, I said, that's totally a okay. I mean, right. I'm I'm gonna be good. I said we we will still maintain your place. <laughs> so I thought it was gonna be one of those meetings. And I remember we met at um, Harry's on a Monday, and we were talking and talking. And I'm like, okay, because I'm a matter of fact. I'm like, okay, you right, know, got, the, to got it. the niceties. <laughs> so like, what's next? Right. And so he said, um, you got it. And I said, I got it. And I said, and I thought to myself, I'm like, oh my gosh, how do I unravel everything that I poured my heart into? Mm-hmm. Um, that that was the big thing. How do you go and communicate that back? Yeah, I mean, as far as leaving, leaving, yeah, workforce. leaving, L- literally. And I will, you know, most people don't. Well, actually, probably only a handful know the story. I worked right. I didn't take any time off before the transition. I literally worked until about three o'clock on a Thursday. I remember my staff wheeling me out, literally wheeling me out of the building. Building. On a Thursday, and by 5 o'clock that same day, I was at Hotel Duval at the time um, attending an event on behalf of TCC with my new name tag. Mm. Same day. Same day. And on that Friday, which was the next day, I'm going into my office and realizing that, you know what, you've done it. And on, you know, this is a transition. And that next Monday, three days later, three work days, I was presenting to leadership Tallahassee about the vision of workforce development at Tallahassee Community College. So I assume you've been able to find time for a day or two off somewhere <laughs> since then, right? I, I am not known for taking time off. Most people will know that. You know, I do the holidays because they're on the books, but not known for taking a whole lot right. of time off. <laughs> All right. So just real quickly, tell us what you do in your job now. What does it mean to be vice president for workforce innovation? It really is the connection for our community. If you're a job seeker or individuals seeking promotion or movement throughout your career, going to TCC, creating programs for that. And if you're employers, how do you find your talent? How do we create that talent together? That's in a nutshell. I work with and with community, ensuring that relationships are in place that support all right. those initiatives. Okay. Mm-hmm. So let me ask you a tough question. This is my only not you question. Yeah. All right. Are we training enough people for the right jobs to meet the future economic development needs of our community? 
I will say that we are training in the right areas. Some of them are not known yet just because of where we are. I mean, you just don't know what you don't know. But um, is there an opportunity to train more? Yeah, in the area of healthcare, with everybody all hands on deck, there is still the need for more nurses. There is still the need for more, you know, medical administrative specialists. Mm -hmm. Um, Yes, so we're training. We need um, a whole lot more of that. I think what we should see differently that employers are realizing that you're going to have to play an important role in getting your workforce trained. What do I mean by that? You're going to need to be at the table with education. If you have an idea of what you want your workforce to look like, you need to be at the table in advisory council capacity, sharing what those needs are and helping shape the curriculum. But the potential's here. Like we, Potential we is can here. do it. We we can do it. We can do it through collaboration. We can do it through collaboration. Um, I have no doubt. Because that's what it's going to take. I mean, you see it played out in other communities. It's not a secret sauce. It's not a special ingredient. It's called partnership. So you do that and it works. Right. Okay. All right, good. Thanks. I just wanted to touch on that while (laughs) while I had you here. All right. So you've been, we touched on this a little bit before, but you've been honored with many awards for leadership, economic development, um, several for being an, an effective woman leader in the community. What is your response to those kind of awards? I know you give them to your mom. You don't keep them in your I house. Don't keep them. <laughs> right. So, but it's got to be rewarding. I mean, I know you're humble and you're trying to keep the focus on how that impacts other people. But do you ever take a second just to kind of feel good about being recognized in that way? I, I absolutely do. I feel good in the moment, but realize. You know, there's a huge responsibility that comes even with that, having received that award. Now there's even more right. that you need to be accountable for. Um, the ones probably that have stood out more to me are the awards um, that have been um, initiated by colleagues and certainly those that really, for me, say community, mm-hmm. that you've made an impact in your community, which is all that I wanted to do in right. the beginning. Right. Yeah. Okay, two that I also assume would be near the top of your list are the ones that come from TCC, yeah. being named to the Hall of Fame in 2017, and, and then in 2019 being the Economic Innovator of the Year. So I know those are big deals. I know the Hall of Fame is a really big deal for the people. I know several people who have received that, and it just means the world to them. So it, it means the world because, again, I go back to the little girl on the campus with the backpack. Um, how do you become somebody? And to realize that you can, you don't have to go to the largest city. You don't have to go to New York or anywhere else to be appreciated. There's impactful work that can happen here. And to be recognized, I can go to the wall on our campus and, and see my my name. To me, it's an honor of my parents and the work that they've put into me, um, their investment, which is why I then created a scholarship for them. At TCC, it's called paying it forward. It's in okay. my, the name of my parents, oh, nice. be, so that we get to do that with someone, someone else. The innovator piece. Um, I will tell you that as a leader, you go through some thoughts about rebranding yourself or adding to. Uh, maybe it's not a full rebrand. And so in my case, I thought workforce development is where I've always been, but innovation was where it was moving to. Mm-hmm. And I thought I'm going to focus completely on doing things that are innovative and messaging about those things. And to get the award, I was like, okay, you can do this. So it's always, you know, I'm in this lab. That's how I always envision. I'm in this lab and I'm seeing what's going to work. And when it does, I'm like, okay, now that's the secret sauce for this. Let's go on to the next. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, just a couple weeks ago, you received the Idol and Car Exemplary Leadership Award. What what was that one for? (laughs) So... This is such a great story. It started off with just, it was an application that my colleague had submitted on my behalf at TCC and a fellow vice president for another award. However, when the uh, review committee saw the body of work that I'd done throughout my tenure, Mm -hmm. they submitted a nomination for that particular award. So when I got the notification, I thought, Okay, first, what is it? I was glad, you know, I was like, okay, yay. But then I did not understand the depth of it until I read a little bit further and I thought, this thing is international. Oh my goodness. Oh yeah, I didn't even, I didn't realize that. It's international. And so I was floored beyond whatever to know that because I understood that, hey, there's going to be a conference and you have to receive it in person. But I thought, really? And I delved into it more. I was like, it's because it's global. It's leaders from all over the country or in world, not country, but world. And I thought, 
what an honor. So that's the one that probably floored me more than anything, not from a lack of hard work, um, but just the recognition of how it even started. It started from a colleague who saw something and it ended up being this thing. That's why I always tell leaders and others that I mentor, you know what, don't, don't follow the awards, stay focused on the work. You will mm. be recognized. Right. Don't get lost on the awards. Right. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, congratulations. Thank you. That, Thank that's you. Very, very impressive. Um, and you also are a graduate of both Leadership Tallahassee and Leadership Florida. Um, how did you enjoy those experiences? I always tell Leadership Tallahassee was the best choice that I could have ever made um, in terms of connecting and establishing relationships that go beyond. I mean, there's just a genuine, I'm not sure how these programs do it, but once you're a part of it, you just seem, it just seems like you were meant to be family and mm -hmm. you stay connected. So really great investment of time. What class were you? 24, the best class ever. I'm not sure. sure why you didn't know sure. that one, but <laughs> the best class ever. You got to know about that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, everybody's the best everybody's class Everybody's the best class. Well, I was uh, 36. Oh, and well. we, did, we did pretty well, too. So. <laughs> well, and I think, you know, again, I love the fact that they take on emerging leaders as well as, you know, perceived existing leaders. And to fast forward and see in our class how folks in the dreams that they talked about, how they've lived them out. Mm -hmm. So it's just been neat to watch that. Yep. And the same for Leadership Florida, which expanded, you know, my thoughts even beyond. I'm thinking... How in the world? So 55 people that get selected each year across the state of Florida and being a part of that and you, you know, they're judges, they're all kinds of people. I mean, there's senators, there's governors, and you're thinking, what in the world? So that was an experience that I absolutely love and, and stay involved with, but really stretches your mind and you think more than just your tri-county area, you start thinking statewide. So right. beautiful. Yeah. You also sit on n numerous boards and volunteer a lot of time in the community. And I... It seems like from looking at them, some of the boards are just naturally kind of part of your position, but other ones aren't. Other reflect your your desire to serve in different ways. So kind of how do you make those decisions? Because I know that's probably tough. You probably get asked a lot. And how do you make time for all that? So I would tell everyone, my organizational skills came by way of my first job, Department of Revenue. When you get 700 cases that you got to manage, you got to figure it out and you got a quota. Right. So that's what the organizational skills. I've always been focused on how to, you know, slice and dice time. So with my service, I always, one, find out their mission. I interview them as much as they interview me mm -hmm. to see if there's alignment. Um, I also see what, you know, what's on the horizon for them, what's the time commitment required, if I can meet it. I don't want to be a board member in name only. So everything that you see, their service, and more than likely, I'm an officer, if not the chair. So <laughs> I can't imagine you going halfway on any of this. <laughs> Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so with those organizations, yes, um, many of them, probably 80% of them are in direct alignment to what I do. It just makes sense. Right. Office of Economic Vitality, the research park, uh, the chambers. But then there are some that, you know, you think about any, which, which is the Institute for Nonprofit Innovation and Excellence. I believe in the nonprofit work, the value that they provide, the support that they, you know, offer in the way of our community. Um, Big Ben Hospice, that had been one, though I knew that they did great work. I was always, I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't want to be on a board that we're just talking about death all the time. And that's so not what it is. It was right. really about making that experience beautiful. And so, you know, spent four years there. So I've literally tried to, you know, make sure that it was things that I was interested in and that I could give back. Mm -hmm. You know, what role can I play more than just, you know, being a name on the roster? Right. Mm -hmm. Assuming you do have any time left over, <laughs> is there anything you enjoy outside of work and volunteering, any interests or hobbies or anything you just like to do? I, I enjoy I enjoy exercising. I enjoy just really just being out. I haven't been able to be out a whole lot in the current environment, right. um, but being out, um, I also enjoy, I enjoyed um, traveling. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully again someday. Hopefully again someday. Yeah. So that, that's that been, you know. Like the, out of the country? Out of, out, out of the country, exploring, yeah, yeah exploring. So um, got a chance to, you know, Panama, got a chance to do, um, you know, London, um, you know, Costa Rica, but just different places of yeah. seeing and appreciating all the beauty that's out there. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's a lot. All right, Kim, looking back, what is the one thing or person that you would say changed the trajectory of your life um, to this point? Um, Laura Young. Mm -hmm. Laura Young, of course, you know, by just in general, you know, your parents, but the one that was outside of a family member would be Laura Young, high school, English right. teacher. Right. Yes. 
The one that told you to write, yeah. write your dream down? Yeah, write it down. Yeah. Then do that. She said, then do that. And I thought, wow. So, and it sounds like you've carried that on, but the, the actual physical act of writing your dream down on a piece of paper made a difference. It made a difference. And, and it still does. All right, final question. All right, the podcast is named How I Got Here. Yes. And we've talked about how you got to this point in your life. So where do you think here might be for you in three to five years from now? Three to five years from now, I would say still being impactful on a larger level. Yeah, an expanded level. What does that mean? I'm impacting the state of Florida, impacting national issues and initiatives. That's what I, that's what I envision for myself. Okay. Related to workforce? Related to related to workforce, yes. Similar, but on a bigger scale. Right. Yeah, very similar on a bigger scale, but I, I do also, because of the different, I, ca- I call it the peel-off things that, that I've done and the groups that I've worked with, there's so many different directions that it can, it can go in. And I think, you know, life is generally about opportunities that you plan for along the way. And I think for me... I've just had this great old opportunity of working in a variety of different areas that do center themselves on workforce development, but it's it's community, it's it's all of those different aspects of, you know, of how do you put all this in one job? And I would say I have all those things in one job. Yeah. That was Kim Moore. With so many options now available in post-secondary education and job training, I'm grateful for community leaders like Kim whose vision and impact will truly be felt for generations to come. Thanks for listening to the show. You can subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, please leave us a review. It really does make a difference. Thanks to my amazing staff at Fiori Communications, who pick up the slack while I'm working on these podcasts, and to Troy Bloom for composing our theme music. You can hear more of Troy's creations on Facebook and Instagram at Troy Bloom Music. To connect with the podcast or suggest a future guest, follow us on social media or email us at podcast at fioricommunications.com.